Good morning, everyone. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Dean, go sit down. <laughs> Dean. <laughs> hey. <laughs> sit down, young man. <laughs> welcome, everyone. If, if you're a visitor, we'd like to say welcome. And we also ask you, if you're online, to text HI to 636-742-1011 or fill out the visitor card in the pew. We promise we won't come, you know, stalk you. Um, but we would like to know uh, if you have enjoyed your experience here. We'd also like to know if there's any prayer requests that you have. So please fill out the card. Online folks, you can also like or comment on the live stream. So we have a few announcements today. Uh, as you know, March 20th through the 23rd, we're having our prayer meetings for the Engage Conference. Please turn in any prayer requests in the foyer. We would love to be able to pray for you individually as well as to pray for the conference. March 26th, right after church, we're having a vacation Bible school meeting. So we invite anyone who is at all interested in it or uh, would like to know more about it, please come and join us. Um, and then, of course, that same evening is the start of our Engage conference. Dinner will be at 4.30 um, here downstairs in the Fellowship Hall, and then the service will be at 6. April, 20, or April 19th through the 21st is the FBC Gray Summit Women's Conference. Uh, please make sure you've given your money to Sarah, and um, you will have a fabulous time. If you have any questions, you can ask her all about it. Uh, we're also taking donations of the pre-filled eggs, Easter eggs for the Easter egg um, hunt out in the uh, out, up by the pavilion, out in the grass there. So please donate some uh, pre-filled eggs, preferably not chocolate, so that it doesn't melt. Um, although the way this weather's going, who knows? But maybe it'll be better by then. Uh, there's also Easter lily forms in the bulletin. Please make sure you fill those out. We want a lot of Easter lilies up here at the front to make it look beautiful. Also, we'll be preparing for the Annie Armstrong offering in April. So this is for um, what we used to call the home mission. I know they call it something different now. But um, this is for our missionaries who work here in the United States, and they sometimes get overlooked. It's glamorous to be a missionary overseas, not so much here at home, but their job is vital. And they help so many people. I know of ones here in the St. Louis area who are working downtown in areas with lots of apartment buildings and things like that who are trying to pull people together and get them excited about Christ. So this is a vital mission. So please give your money to support them. And I believe that is all of our announcements. So thank you, and I hope you enjoy the service. Thank you, Lori, for uh, talking about that. You know, when you think about home missions, not just talking about uh, church planters, but we are talking about those people, but think about inner city ministry. Uh, think about uh, the, our, our college campuses. Do you think our college campuses need Jesus? And so some of our home missions have to do with college ministries, BSUs, as we used to call them, right? And so Baptist campus ministries and things like that. And so that's a very important thing. So there, um, there will be, you'll see them around, more stuff about Annie Armstrong. Just be thinking about the gift that you would give this Easter time as we ramp up for that. Let me pray. You ever have one of those Sundays? You ever just have one of those days? And you just need to give it to the Lord. And so <laughs> today's one of them days. And so uh, join me in prayer, and then we'll hear our prelude together. Father, Lord, still our hearts today to worship you, to honor you, to give you the, the glory that is due to your name. Father, we thank you for those that are visiting with us today and those that are returning back, Lord, after sickness and various other things. And Lord, we just pray that we might bring glory to your name today through our song, through the, the reading of scripture together, through our time in the word as we study together, Lord. We just pray that we might be a fellowship of faith that is exalting the name of Jesus and we pray that you would remove every boundary, remove every uh, blockage, Lord, that is preventing us, that is distracting us from worship today, and that we might give our full attention to consecrate this hour for your glory. For it's in Jesus' name that we pray, and all God's people said, let's hear the prelude together.
All right, I just I invite you to stand with us as we sing together. We introduced this song some time back. It's called His Mercy is More, and I invite you to sing it with us as we worship the Lord together. Praise the Lord, His mercy is more, stronger than darkness, new every morn. Our sins, they are many, His mercy is more. Let's sing what love. What love could remember no wrongs we have done? Omniscient, all-knowing, he counts not their sum. Thrown into a sea without bottom or shore. Our sins, they are many, his mercy is more. Sing with patience. What patience would wait as we constantly roam? What Father so tender is calling us home? He welcomes the weakest, the vilest, the poor. Our sins, they are many, His mercy is more. Praise the Lord, His mercy is more. new every morn our sins they are many his mercy is more that's right sing what riches what riches of gladness he lavished on us his blood was the payment his life was the cost we stood neath the debt we could never afford our sins, they are many, His mercy is more. Praise the Lord, His mercy is more. Stronger than darkness, new every morn. Our sins, they are many, His mercy is more. Praise the Lord. Sing that. His, His mercy, mercy is, is more, stronger than darkness, new every morn. Our sins, they are many. His mercy is more. Our sins, they are many. His mercy is more. Our sins, they are many. His mercy is more. Amen to that. All hail the power of Jesus' name, let angels prostrate fall. Bring forth the royal diadem and crown him Lord of all. Bring forth the royal diadem and crown him Lord. race he ransomed from the fall hail him who saves you by his grace and crown him lord of all hail him who saves you by his grace and crown him lord Join the air. 
song and crown him Lord of all. Sing this again. I have a maker, he formed my heart, before even time began, my life was in his hands, he knows my name, he knows my name. sees each tear that falls and hears me when I call. I have a father. I have a father. He calls me his own. He'll never my name. He knows my name. He knows my every thought. He sees each tear that falls and hears me when I call. That, that blesses you, that thought today. So we sing to the Lamb that was slain, that is worthy of all of our honor and glory, all of our praise. Thank you for the cross, Lord. Thank you for the price you paid, bearing all my sins.
Son of God, the treasure of heaven crucified. Worthy is the Lamb. As our ushers come to receive our offering. just thank you for this opportunity to be in your house this morning to study your word together, Lord. We pray for the visitors here this morning. We pray that they will get a blessing from the service today, Lord. Be with those that are unable to be here today for you know the reason why. Lord, be with Brother Tommy this morning. He's bringing the message. Pray that this message will reach out in hearts that need to make decisions for you. Lord, bless this offering now to honor in your glory. These things we ask your name. Amen. Hey, there I am. All right. How y'all doing? Is it warm in here? Or is it the suit coat? What's going on here? All right. Glad you guys are doing good. It has been a week. I'm sure it's been that way for y'all as well. But good to be in the house of the Lord today. Hope that you are excited to be here. And uh, glad that we can share this time in the Word together. You've probably heard of the phrase, less is more. Anybody heard, less is more? You've heard of this phrase. Some of y'all have from sleep already. (laughs) Less is more. We don't like less is more. It goes against all of our natural tendencies. Our natural feeling is more is more, right? More is more. We want more stuff. More is better. I googled, in fact, more is more, and I found a perfume named more is more, a band named more is more, a song named more is more, a book. And all kinds of other things. Why? Because less is more turns our worldview upside down. And we want to turn it back to what is more comfortable. What is more comfortable to us is more is more. We want more sleep, more TV, more nachos, more money, more stuff in the garage, more vacation, more is more. Back when I was in seventh grade, I was, you know, still trying to figure out all this hygiene stuff. Y'all can maybe relate, right? And I saw an ad for Axe Body Spray. Y'all remember that? Some of y'all know what I'm talking about. And the guys in the ad campaign, they were spraying this Axe Body Spray on themselves and all the girls, like girls would smell them from another country away and get in a, in a plane to go. And I saw that and I said, TV would not lie to me. And so I begged my parents, I need Axe Body Spray. And so they bought me Axe Body Spray. And before school, I sprayed some of the Axe body spray on me. And I was sitting there in science class right next to the redhead girl that I thought was kind of cute. She had, a, she had a stud nose ring, which was kind of punk rock. I thought that was cool, right? And the first time she ever said anything to me this whole semester, she turned to me that day 
And she said, hey, you smell nice. And I said to myself, TV was right. <laughs> it's working. Wow, positive female attention. Can you imagine this? And then in my seventh grader mind, a new plan was hatched. I said, if a little X body spray, you know what I'm saying? This is my seventh grade mind. If a little bit of X body spray will make the redhead girl talk with me, imagine what a lot of X body spray will do. After all, more is more. And so there I am. I am absolutely showering in X body spray because it has been, it's the best thing that's happened to me in my life at this point. And my brother knocks on the bathroom door and he just says, what are you doing? I can smell that out here. You're going to make people's nose hairs curl up. And that day, I learned a valuable lesson. Less is more. Say it with me. Less is more. When I got into college, I had to learn that less calories is many times better than more calories. I'm still trying to figure that part out. Still trying to get the hang of that. <laughs> when you have to move and, 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 and you have to move a county over, you realize less stuff is better than more stuff. When you have a baby for the first time, you realize that more sleep is better than less sleep. And in our relationship with Christ, there are times, though, when God calls us to less rather than more, and for good reason. Throughout the Bible, we find God's people fasting, and that involved humbling themselves and abstaining from feasting, just getting by on what it takes to survive. In the book of Esther, you ladies remember, the Jewish people, they fasted for three days before Esther went before the king at the risk of her own life. They got the attention of heaven because less is more. And in the book of Jonah, this is a spoiler alert for Wednesday night people. Uh, this will be this Wednesday that we talk about it. The people of Nineveh, they fasted and they prayed to the Lord that God would not destroy their city. They, they wanted to appeal to heaven and, and, and get a hold of, of this God who was justly going to punish their sin because less is more. And before Paul and Barnabas, they started their first missionary journey. The church, the early church, they gathered around, they laid hands on them and they fasted and they prayed, worshiping God before they sent them out because less is more. And most important of all, before Jesus began his earthly ministry, he spent 40 days and 40 nights in the desert fasting and praying, not because there was any deficiency in him whatsoever, but because it was right and good for him to do this as a model for us to teach us to deprive himself of earthly things temporarily so you can focus on eternal things and heavenly things. And so when it comes to fasting from eating, Baptists, we don't like to talk about this. We, didn't, we don't typically enjoy this conversation. But as we look at the beginning of this Engage conference next week, I am asking First Baptist Church of Grace Summit to begin to fast and to pray and to seek God in a mighty way this week. And I want to look to the scriptures to hear a word from God on this subject. And before we're through, I'll actually share with you, not in a way to promote that we're, you know, so awesome because we're not, but Sarah and I will share with you what the Schmidt family will do this week to fast and to pray and to give some important information ahead of the Engage conference. So if you have your copy of God's Word, if you have your device where you can look it up, you can turn with me to Matthew chapter 6. I'd, I'd like for you to turn there so you can see God's Word and to read it with me in Matthew, does I say Mark? Matthew chapter 6, verse 16 through 18. This is the Gospel of Matthew. It's one of my favorite uh, books because it has the largest chunks of teaching from Jesus. And it's most famous for what we call the Sermon on the Mount, which contains some of Jesus' most prolific, most well-known teachings. There we hear the Lord's Prayer the, the phrase, turn the other cheek, the Beatitudes, and, and much, much more. And as Jesus is teaching this sermon, he is jumping from topic to topic to topic. But one thing remains the, the overall theme of his message. Jesus has come to bring a kingdom, the kingdom of God, that turns all of our expectations upside down. Once we understand that, we can understand the Sermon on the Mount. And once we can understand that, we can understand what fasting means. And to, and to pray and fast and get serious about the things of God. So if you have uh, Matthew chapter 6, starting verse 16 through 18, I'd invite you to stand as we read it uh, from God's Word. If you don't have a Bible with you today, you can see it up on the screens. Just three little verses. He says, whenever you fast, 
Don't be gloomy like the hypocrites, for they make their faces unattractive so that their fasting is obvious to people. Truly, I tell you, they have their reward. But when you fast, put oil on your head, wash your face, so that your fasting isn't obvious to others, but to your Father who is in secret. And your Father who sees in secret will reward you. Let's pray. Father, as we come to this moment, Lord, this is maybe something that there are folks in here who never thought about this, uh, or, or haven't thought about it in many, many, many years. I haven't studied this in quite a while. Lord, will you bring to mind this teaching? Would you help us to understand it aright? Lord, would you help to illuminate our eyes to see what you would have us to see in the teachings of Jesus? And Lord, would you call us as a church to fasting, to prayer, that God would move mightily in our midst? Lord, it's, it doesn't depend upon us. It depends upon you. And so as an act of depending upon you and submitting to your will, we pray, Lord, that this week, next week, Lord, and forever, we would, we would surrender our will and surrender ourselves to your will, Lord, that you might have your way within our lives, Lord, that you might be glorified in and through us. In Jesus' name, amen. Go ahead and take a seat. I've titled this message, this time that we're going to spend together, I've titled it Fast Facts. And, the, and the, because I'm clever, okay? And the big idea that we're going to see is simply this. Christians are blessed by fasting. That's the core message of this. Christians are blessed by fasting when we do it God's way. It's not the reason that we do it. We do it to be obedient to God, to glorify Him. But there is an unmistakable blessing and reward which comes with fasting. Jesus even says so right here in the text. The reward isn't a new car. It isn't wads of cash. It isn't a big house. But it may come in the form of victory over sin, over freedom, over shame, and so much more. And so our outline today, so that you know where we're going, we're going to look at three defining traits of godly fasting. I want you to look very closely at what we just read there in verses 16 and 17 first. Jesus says, whenever you fast, say the word whenever, whenever, whenever right? And, and look at verse 17. Jesus says, but when you fast, say the word when. And those are powerful words. He didn't say, if you fast, here is what to do. Did you notice that? He didn't say, if you fast. He said, when you fast, here is what you should do. The Old Testament is full of God's people fasting, even though there was only one fast that was required in the Old Testament, and that was the Day of Atonement. Even despite that, they went beyond what is required of them, and they fasted often. They fasted to mourn, to repent, to pray for a result, to get God's guidance, and various other reasons. And it usually involved abstaining from food, maybe totally for a shorter period of time, but maybe limiting food for a longer period of time as you engage in intense prayer in your life. And Jesus expected that his disciples would fast. At the beginning of this year, on our vision casting sermon here at Grace Summit, I preached Matthew chapter 9, verse 14 through 17, and it had to do with fasting. And maybe you'll remember that the disciples of John the Baptist, they came to Jesus, they said, why do we fast and the Pharisees fast, but your disciples, man, they are just, they're just chowing down. They're feasting, right? They're, they're having a good time. And do you remember what Jesus said to them? He said, can the wedding guests mourn as long as the bridegroom is with them? He said, the days will come. Now, I want you to listen to that. The days will come when the bridegroom, that's Jesus, is taken away from them, and then they will fast. Did you hear that? Then they will fast. There's a time that Jesus expects his followers will fast, and that time is now. That time is now, that we would engage in this at, at times, and that's why Jesus gives this instruction. So an essential trait of godly fasting is that, number one, we fast with regularity. We fast with regularity. There's a big difference between if and when. Did you notice that? There's a seismic difference between if I say to my kids, if you clean this room, I'll pick up ice cream. Right? That gives them an option. But that's not usually how I speak with my kids. I usually say, when you clean this room, you can see the light of day again. That's usually how that goes, right? There's a big difference between if and when. If says there's an option. When says this is going to happen. Which do you think Jesus meant when he said, whenever you fast, when you fast, this is what you should do. So even though Jesus said that, we take fasting as something that only super Christians do 
right? Only really devoted, maybe like somebody who becomes a monk, shaves their head, wears, you know, a, a robe, goes out into some far off land away from everybody and just prays all day and fasts. That's what we think. Or maybe somebody who is in dire straits, in desperation, has no one else to turn. Then maybe they would fast and then they would pray. But let me tell you this, each one of us is in dire straits. Each one of us is in desperation apart from God. Each one of us in this room is in over their heads, in need of God's grace, in need of God's mercy. And we should not dispense of fasting as something that is an optional thing for super Christians. He said, when you pray, when you fast, when you give, do these things. And so he expects us to be engaging in that. It doesn't tell us how often we should do this. But, but if you have never had a season of fasting and prayer, if you're sitting here in this room and you've never had a season where you have fasted, maybe this will be a week where you will have a time of obedience to Jesus in this thing that Jesus has told us that we will do, that we have to do. And so I want you to look at verse, the, the rest of verse 16. He says, whenever you fast, don't be gloomy like the hypocrites. That, that Greek word has to do with like the actors who would pretend. They would put on a mask and they would pretend to be something that they are not. That's where we get this idea of, of, of a hypocrite. For they make their faces unattractive. Some of y'all are saying, well, you don't need any help, right? <laughs> you, don't, you, don't need to, you don't need to try that hard. But they would do that. They would, they would put on that mask. They would put on a fake uh, persona. They would make their faces to be gloomy and unattractive, to make their fasting obvious to people. And he says, truly, I tell you, they have their reward. And throughout the Old Testament, we read about people fasting and repenting. And when they would do that, they would put on sackcloth and ashes. You remember that. And I don't think that that was wrong for them to do that because their heart was in the right place. They, they had this in their minds that they needed to humble themselves before God. They put on, uh, but the the religious hypocrites that Jesus is exposing, he is saying, man, they're putting on their dirtiest clothes. They're making themselves sullen. They're putting on their best frown, right? They're going, you know, it's bad. Oh, look at me. I'm, I'm suffering so much so that everyone will notice how spiritual and how pious they are. And Jesus over and over calls out this behavior because he is not interested in your religious performance. He is interested in your heart position. Right? I'm going to say that again because some of y'all are not hearing me. Jesus is interested not in your religious performance. He is interested in your heart position. And your heart position, when oriented right, it, it, might, it, it will result in works. It will result in you doing some things. But you can't put the cart before the horse. Your heart position must be right first, and it must follow with what you are doing. Jesus is not interested in how holy and righteous you think you are but about how honest, how open you are, how much you will surrender to him in order to live life and life more abundantly. He says this to all who would follow him. He says, be careful not to practice your righteousness in front of others to be seen by them. So whenever you give to the poor, don't sound a trumpet before you. We talked about heralds in our Sunday school class and the idea that you know, the king would have this guy, that his job was just to sound the trumpet to, to get everyone's attention at the same time, to say, hey, look, Look at what's going on. Here's the news, right? And Jesus is saying, when you give to the poor, when you do a good thing, you know, don't, don't sound the trumpet. Don't sound the herald and say, hear ye, hear ye. Some good charitable stuff is happening over here. Everybody come and look, right? He says, be careful to do that. Whenever you give to the poor, don't sound a trumpet before you, as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and on the streets, to be applauded by other people. He says, whenever you pray. Don't be like the hypocrites because they love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the street corners to be seen by people in Matthew chapter 6. So an essential trait of godly fasting is number two, when we fast with sincerity, when we really mean it, when this is not a religious show that we're doing, that what we're doing this week, what I'm saying to you this week, what the Schmidt family is doing this week is not a, a, just a religious show to try to get uh, religious points or to show how serious we are. And maybe some preachers like to stand up and say, man, we're the only church that's got it right. Everybody other church, they're not doing this stuff. Man, we are the church that's for real. Man, that is baloney. That is baloney. And Jesus calls us out of that mentality. Today's world is full of people that cannot do anything or anything worth, worth, worthwhile without trying to leverage it for their platform and for their popularity. Today, it could be said of us, no good deed goes untweeted. Right? This is, this is how we live. We cannot read, the, read a Bible without getting our, 
Our, our coffee right, our Bible laid out on our counter. Oh, oh, that looks too dirty. Let me clean my counter first. Put the Bible, put the coffee, you know, put my hand so they know it's really me, right? Click. Oh, I just, God spoke to me so much in my morning devotion. Wasn't it so good, right? And you spent, you spent 20 minutes setting up the scene for the perfect Instagram post, and you spent about five minutes actually reading that scripture. It's hypocritical. No good deed goes untweeted. We call it performative activism. Wikipedia defines that as activism done to increase one's social capital rather than because of one's devotion to a cause. You know what's easy and costs you literally nothing? Sharing junk on Facebook, right? Look at, look at how socially aware I am. Look at how important I am. Look, look at how uh, into these things that I am on Facebook, on Twitter, on Instagram. You know, it's super easy for folks to share Black Lives Matter on their Facebook, on their Twitter, on their Instagram. You know what's a lot harder than, than sharing something? Actually loving your neighbor as yourself. Actually treating people like they are made in the image of God just as you are. That will cost you every single time. It's easy to share. It's easy to jump on a bandwagon. It's a lot harder to love somebody like Jesus loves you. That will cost you. And Jesus was intent on exposing performative activism before social media was even a thing. Jesus was calling out this attitude saying, hey, this is not what we are about. Don't, don't just make a show of yourself because that is oriented towards you and not towards others. So when we give, it's to an audience of one. When we pray, it's to an audience of one. When we sing up here together, it doesn't really matter if the guitar doesn't work. <laughs> you know, it doesn't really matter what's happening. It's to an audience of one. And when we fast together, it's for an audience of one. It's what Jesus thinks of us that counts with integrity, with sincerity. Jesus in a parable, he says this. He talks about two men that went up to the temple and they went to pray. And one was a Pharisee and one was a tax collector. And the tax collector, um, the, the, the Pharisee, he was standing by himself. He prayed like this. He said, God, I thank you that I am not like other men, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. That's what he said. I fast twice a week. Did you notice that? That's what he said. I fast twice a week. I give tithes of all that I get. But the tax collector standing far off, Jesus said, would not even lift up his eyes to heaven but he beat his chest, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner, Luke 18. And Jesus is teaching. He says, which one of them was justified? Which one of them really got it? Which one of them really understood? Yeah, he fasted, he tithed, he did all the religious stuff, but it meant nothing because he was a hypocrite, because he was an arrogant jerk, right? Because he lorded it over everyone else. He was pious and insincere, so it meant nothing. And the prophet Isaiah, he's speaking the word of the Lord, and he said, Behold, you fast only to quarrel and to fight and to hit with a wicked fist. Fasting like yours this day will not make your voice to be heard on high. That's what Isaiah says. Is not this the fast that I choose to loose the bonds of wickedness, to undo the straps of the yoke, to let the oppressed go free? And to break every yoke, Isaiah 58, 4 through 6. So, so if all that we do this week, if you, if, you, if you run with me and we do this together, if all that we do this week is get a little hungrier, but we're still fighting, we're still quarreling, we're still arrogant, we're still mean to one another, it means absolutely zero. It means nothing. Jesus said of these hypocrites, yeah, they receive their reward. In other words, yeah, they'll get Facebook points. They'll get internet points. They'll get their accolades and their applause, but that's all they'll ever get. And I don't know about you, but I want the things that I do to actually last in eternity. I want the things that I do to actually matter to the one whose opinion matters, right? It doesn't really matter how much applause, how much clapter I get out in the world, right? I want, I want Jesus to look on me and say, well done, my good and faithful servant. I'd ask of you to open your heart to say, man, I'm... If I do anything, I'm going to do it because I, I love the Lord, because I follow Jesus. And, and in this highly, intensely public where everything that we do, every thought that we think, man, I, I see some of these, these pastors and they're ready to jump on every single Twitter controversy. They have something to say about everything that goes on. They, they're reading all day long, scanning all these things so that they can give their hot take about every single issue that comes up. When do you have time to actually love people and actually be with your family and actually do the things that matters? 
The answer is you just don't. And so if, if we fast, I'm not trying to talk you out of fasting, by the way. If we fast today, let's, let's do it with a sincere heart. If we pray and we seek the Lord, let's not do it because it's on the church calendar. It's just a religious thing to do. It's just, just another day that the doors will be open and, hey, I'm just going to try to check things off the list and go to church and do the things. But let's do it with a sincere heart to Jesus so that the things that we do touch us a day that we won't see with earthly eyes. Look at verse 17. He tells us how fasting is supposed to be. He says, put oil on your head and wash your face so that your fasting isn't obvious to others but to the Father who is in secret. Now, it's very important that we understand what Jesus means. You're just thinking, oil, washing face. How are you going to get out of this one, right? When we study the book of Ecclesiastes, there's a part that says, go, eat your bread with joy, drink your wine with a merry heart, for God has already approved what you do. Let your garments be always white. Let not oil be lacking on your head. Throughout the Psalms, we hear about oil that, that man, he makes my cup. It runs over. He, he anoints me with oil. There's a point in the Psalms that says, you cause the grass to grow for the livestock and plants for man to cultivate, that he may bring forth food from the earth and wine to gladden the heart of man, oil to make his face shine, and bread to strengthen man's heart. Isn't that a happy passage? Not very Baptist, but it's, it's very happy, right? Nonetheless, that's tongue in cheek, all right? Oil was very important. Stay with me now. Oil was very important for the ancient peoples in a dry climate. Oil acted as a moisturizer and as a sunblock. It kept the desert sun off of you. It was also fragrant, right, to mask bad odors that maybe some folks walking in the desert sun would have emitted, right? I'm not, you know, it was like the Axe body spray of the day, okay? No. They also used oils as medicines. Listen to what Jesus is saying here. He says, don't stop doing that stuff. Don't, don't, don't stop doing that. Don't stop doing the regular routine stuff that you're doing. Don't, don't neglect yourself. The point of fasting is not self-destruction, in other words. That we may choose, depending on our medical needs, to limit some of the food that we intake as we pray, according to what is reasonable, because hurting yourself is not the goal. Jesus gives no indication that we should change our outward appearance at all. He might say to followers today, get up, take a shower, Put on deodorant, spray just a little bit of that Axe body spray on you, right? Moisturize, get out there, and then live for God's glory. It's not about what people see. It's not about impressing other people. So number three, an essential trait of godly fasting is when we fast with positivity, not just with regularity, not just with sincerity, but also with positivity. He says, get up, wash yourself, put oil on your face, do this. Don't look sullen. Don't look gloomy, right? I remember... Uh, the pastor that I trained under and, and I went to a funeral at another church. And when we met the pastor, he kind of looked like Eeyore from Winnie the Pooh. Anybody remember Eeyore? Y'all remember Eeyore, right? Eeyore is a sad, sad donkey, okay? And, and he's just having a rough time. And this pastor, with his stole and his robes, he just kind of looked, he just kind of, his, his shoulders were sunk and he kind of talked like this and he just walked around like he just didn't want to be there, right? And we met him, and he could not even force a smile. And even the funeral director, this is how I know it was bad. The funeral director, when he walked in, the funeral director looked back at us and said, can you imagine that being your pastor? Right? He said that to us. It was amazing, right? And I, you wanted to scream to him, hey, Jesus is alive. There's something to smile about today, and this might be hard to hear today. Listen, but the ironic thing is you're not really impressing anybody with self-martyrdom. You're not. When did we get this idea that spiritual maturity was to look like that old painting, American Gothic? You remember that? With the guy with the pitchfork and the, and the, the farmer's wife by him? You remember that? I didn't have a picture of it today. Because joy is a fruit of the Spirit in Galatians chapter 5. That means when you have the Spirit within you, joy is produced in you. As, you, as that Spirit thrives in your life, joy is produced in you. That's, can I tell you something? You can smile today. You can smile today. You have something to smile about. Psalm 1611 says, You make known to me the path of life. In your presence there is fullness of joy. At your right hand are pleasures forevermore. Can I tell you something? I still believe that. I still believe that. We may not always be happy. We may not always be pleased with our situation. But we can have resilient joy. I believe that today. We can have resilient joy and contentment. And you are not more spiritual, listen to me, 
when you decide to look and act upset. I'm not talking about mental health issues here. I'm not talking about clinical depression or anything like that. But there is a twisted comfort for some in choosing to self-martyr and choosing to be upset. There's a comfort in, in deciding to stay sad and deciding to stay in this position. Our focus should not be on how we feel or how others feel, but on pursuing the future that God has for us and what he wants in our life. We should be full, solely focused on God with all of our heart, with all of our actions, with all of our affections, because he rewards those who are faithful. When we're attend not on earthly rewards, on platform, on prestige and advancement and wealth and popularity, but on those heavenly rewards that actually matter. Can I tell you something? Less is more. Less is more. We increase spiritually by accepting less physically. My challenge to you this week is to be about fasting and prayer. For some of you, you need to eat at specific times for your medication. And what I, my advice to you is to eat at specific times for your medication because self-destruction is not the goal of fasting. That's not the goal. That's not the point. It's denying yourself enough, whatever that means to you, that you are putting your attention and focus on God. I'll tell you what the Schmidt family will do this week. And this is not parading. This is not trying to be exactly what Jesus told us not to. We're not trying to parade. I'm trying to give by example and, and by, by means of asking for accountability too. Sarah and I started a diet at the beginning of this year. Uh, you can tell with Sarah because she looks great. She's doing awesome. You can't tell with me because I sneak snacks. <laughs> but we've, we have this diet that I'm supposed to be doing. So it doesn't make much sense for us to, to, to ask ourselves to take in less calories. So here's what we're doing. We are going to drink from this Sunday to when we break the fast next Sunday. The only fluids that... Uh, all of our family, except Simon, will drink is water. That's the only fluid. No soda, no milk. I love milk. No milk, no apple juice, no orange juice. You know what I like to do? Our, our refrigerator will make crushed ice, right? And I will crush ice and put the orange juice, and it's like I got my own. It only takes a minute to make orange slush. I want one right now. It's hot in this building. I need an orange slush, somebody, but no, only water, only water. But that's not all, because Sarah is an extremist. <laughs> she is limiting us from sugar. Now, one of my kids, I will not say who, we were supposed to start today. We've had this discussion, and just to tell you how imperfect we are, I saw that little runt walk in here with a cookie and his smile on his face. I mean, his or her face. <laughs> was large. This individual was so happy about himself. And we said, you little sneak. <laughs> I want that cookie. And milk. But no. This is what we're doing this week. Fasting may look different for you than it does for us. At the end of the day, it's something between you and God. What we do is between us and God. I'm just saying this to you by way of, yes, we are, we are doing this and committing to this. I can't make you do anything. I, even if I could, I should not. I can only encourage you, instruct you, challenge you. And this, this much I know, this is my heart this week. No great movement of God ever happened apart from prayer. And fasting is hand in hand with that. And as we approach this Engage Conference, our Revival Week, I'm asking you, as members and friends of First Baptist Church of Grace Summit, everyone present, everyone listening to me online, to begin today, maybe you begin tomorrow, to fast and to pray this week for God to move in our midst. You got that bulletin? You want to hand me that? In your bulletin today, it, <laughs> it doesn't have it. In your bulletin today, you have a couple things. You have Easter lily form, right? You got your bulletin? You don't just throw that away once you get in the building, right? We print these for you. You got your Easter, Easter lily thing. You got another thing. 
It's a prayer request form. Hold this up to you, if you will. Hold, hold this up. Hold this up. Get that out. Get that out. Hold that up. If you don't, we got plenty of bulletins, right? Here's what I want you to do. You don't have to put any kind of identifying information on this at all. You can be completely anonymous. I want you to write your prayer request, something that's on your heart. Maybe it's a, a friend that is lost. You don't have to identify that person by name either. So I just want to pray for a coworker that, that I know is far from Jesus and just kind of spiraling out of control. Maybe, maybe it's somebody that's just on your heart. Maybe it's a situation that seems hopeless. Maybe it's a sickness or an illness. I just want you to write that on there. I just want you to fold it. And then when you get back and back, there's a black box. It's just labeled prayer requests. If that fills up, there's a little church by there that actually has a hole like a piggy bank. You might have to fold it two or three more times. I want you to put that in there. I want you to do that today before you leave. I really, I'd really ask you to do that. And if you do that, those are going to become the prayer prompts that we have this week. This week, we're going to have uh, uh, an open building from 4 to 6 on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, 4 to 6. Uh, be in mind that the choir practice is at 5.30. It, it, it just didn't make sense for us to move that. So you're welcome to come and pray at 5.30 if that's what it works for you. Now, I, I want to be really clear. Just give me a couple minutes to explain this. This is not a service that you come to at 4 o'clock and sit and wait for stuff to happen. It's, it's not going to be one of those things. The, the doors will be open. There will be people here. And, and you can come in at your leisure and come and pray. And maybe you pray for 20 seconds. And then you get up and, and you leave. Maybe you come because of your work schedule at 5.30, 5.45. And you come and you, you pray. And you pray, for, pray until 6. And then you leave. It'll be at your leisure. It's not a service. I, I, my, my challenge for you is this week, just make a, make, carve out some time that you would do that. And, and maybe it's not for you to kneel at an altar like this. Your knees will not allow you to do that. That's okay. You can come. These front rows will be cleared off. You can come and you can just take a prayer prompt and you can sit and you can just pray. And you can pray what's on your heart. You don't have to just do the, the prayer prompt. You just pray what's on your heart. Am I making sense? Is this making sense? This is instructions for this week, right? Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, choir practice starts at 5.30 that day, just letting you know. Thursday, 4 to 6, just carve out a time. And next Sunday, we're going to start. Here's what that's going to look like. Sunday morning, I'm going to preach the theme text. We've got a theme. It's equipped for every good work. We, when I, we did our surveys last time we did Engage Conference, what was on the hearts of our people is we, we feel under-equipped. We feel like we need to be equipped for ministry, to do the service that God has told us to do. Here's my, here's my thing. I'm going to preach the text. Equip for every good work. 2 Timothy 3.17 will be our theme. You come back at 4.30, we're going to have uh, a dinner together. And, and maybe that'll be a breaking of fast for you. And, and maybe I can have some orange juice that day. Something. I don't know. Maybe I can have something sugar related. That would be great. We're going to have dinner together. At 4.30, and then at 6 o'clock, we'll be in here with totally different music people, totally different speakers. Monday, Tuesday, uh, Sunday night, Monday night, Tuesday night. Wednesday night's a little shaky as I stand here. And so I will, I will text out, email out, all that stuff, your information for Wednesday. But 6 o'clock every night this next week, this starting next Sunday, okay? 6 o'clock, Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday, and Sunday, okay? Does that make sense? Clear as mud? So what I'm asking you today is, is, is before that happens, and maybe you're thinking, maybe you're totally alien to all this, and you just like walked in the door, and you're just like, I don't know. Would you say a prayer for First Baptist Church of Grace Summit? And would you just kind of um, maybe make a note to, to pray and to, and to think about our community, to come in and to pray and to do all of these things? Because maybe you've walked in, and maybe you don't even know about Jesus. And I want to tell you today that Jesus lived by the less is more mentality. Jesus lived. He's God in flesh. He came to this earth to get less than he deserved by dying on a cross so that we would get more than we deserved by receiving eternal life. And all you have to do today, if you're in the sound of my voice, is just put your trust in that same Jesus. Just to put your trust in his death, his burial, his resurrection, and you can have new life. You can have hope. And you can begin this journey. Yeah, that sometimes it are seasons of fasting and praying because we seek that Lord who still speaks and still moves and still has a will for our life and is still at work in our world as he builds that same kingdom 
that turns everything upside down, or as we would say, it turns everything right side up. And so would you stand with me and let's pray as we enter into a time of, of invitation. Maybe you'd just like be, to begin praying right now and you'd like to make your way to an altar right here or to a front pew and, and you would just bend a knee to pray and seek after the Lord right now in our midst. Right now in this, as we sing, don't wait. You just come and you just pray. Maybe there is a decision laden upon your heart. And today is the day of decision for you to, to act and to seek his will. I, I pray don't, just as we're singing, you just come. You take my hand. We walk through those decisions together. You be thinking about the, what the Holy Spirit has laid upon your heart. And, and, and maybe just ask the Spirit, would you, maybe, maybe me this week. Maybe I will fast. Maybe I will pray. Maybe I will step out and do something I've never done before for the glory of the Lord. Let's pray together. Father, your spirit is abundantly present in this place. And Lord, I just pray for those who have a decision on their heart and who are just struggling with what to do next. I pray, Lord, that your spirit might move in such a way that maybe even now as we sing, this time of invitation, the season of invitation, that there might be decisions that are made, that, that folks would cry out to the Lord and say, oh God, you, you took less so that I would have more. Lord, you came in flesh and were killed you brutally so that I might have eternal life. And Father, maybe there are Christians here today walking in disobedience, walking far from the Lord, and today is the day that you are calling them home and saying, come and follow Jesus again. Repent of those sins and let that past be gone and enter into a new day. And maybe today that requires a, a new level of obedience and say, today I will. I will begin to fast and pray. Whatever that means to them, whatever is medically sound for them, to begin to, to really be devoted to the Lord in a new way. We pray, Lord, that it, it might happen, that you might be glorified and exalted. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's sing. Decisions are being made. I've wandered far away from God. Now I'm coming home. The paths of sin to Decision heavy upon your heart. Um, one thing you can do is just text decision to 636 742 1011.
And that's a way that, uh, man, if you're just wrestling with something, you don't know what to do next, there's, a, there's a next step for you. There's something that you could do um, right away. If you're watching online, maybe the Lord has put um, a burden upon your heart today. You're seeking after what's next. That's one way that we can get in touch and, and be able to know. Uh, let, let's be faithful to the Lord today. And, and you just be faithful to that leading on your heart. And so don't forget your prayer request card. Uh, don't forget those open times. And uh, just come join me and we'll pray together. And uh, you can pray separately. We could do whatever we want to do, right? And so I think that it will be a good opportunity for us. When it comes to Engage next week, uh, I know that for some of you, every single night that week will be difficult. But uh, if, if you could, if you could, if, you, if you're a busy person and you could make it to one and bring, bring somebody, bring some family member, bring somebody you know, right? Invite somebody. We got to invite cards out there for you that you can take with you. They're yours to take. Take them and, uh, and share that on Facebook. Well, I'd appreciate that. I think that would be a good thing. Uh, but if you can come to two, you're even more of a rock star. If you come to three, you are a rock star, right? If you come to all four, you're a mega rock star, okay? So just, you know, be sure you understand all that, right? So, hmm? Okay. All I want is a cookie right now. You realize this, right? Okay, so. Hey, and, and, and let me know just privately. You know, you don't, don't come up here and, and trumpet it. You know, that goes against what Jesus was saying, right? But maybe if you, if you feel led, just tell me what maybe God would lead, lead on your heart to fast and, and what you're praying about. I'd, I would like to hear. That would bless me. That, anyway, the filter caught that one. Okay, that would bless me. <laughs> let me say that. Uh, is if you told me, I was going to say, that would bless me than a lot of other things people tell me on Sunday morning. So you understand how it is. That would be good. You come and tell me what, what you're fasting about and uh, all that stuff. So I, 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 it, would, it would be a good thing to tell your pastor. So let me pray, and then Sarah's going to sing us out, and uh, you guys have a great, great week. Father, we love you. We thank you for this day that you have made. We rejoice and are glad in it. Thank you for the laughter in the room and the joyous spirit that you give us. Father, as you dismiss us, Lord, we, we just pray that you would just have a mighty move. Lord, we see it happening. And, and we ask, Lord, how about, how about right here? How about right here in Grace Summit? We ask in faith, Lord, that your, your spirit would abundantly sweep through. You would convict of sin. You would bring newness to individuals, to relationships, to families that would touch a day we will never see. As Lord, we seek to be faithful to the next generation. Or would you open our, our eyes, our faculties, would you give our hands and feet life to move, to follow the way of Jesus? And would you receive all glory and honor as your kingdom becomes more and more manifest in this place? As you came and you turned everything backwards from our expectations. You said, blessed are those who mourn. Blessed are the poor in spirit. It defies all of our attitudes. But the Lord, you're, you aren't making things wrong. You're making things right. Father, would you, be, would you help us to be agents of that same kingdom? that your will would be done, your kingdom would come. Father, we would glorify you in all that we do and say. In Jesus' name, amen.